Everybody can go ahead, have a seat or kneel. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for the young women and the little children that are starting this right now. Just thank you for um, giving just every, everyone life. And thank you for um, taking me into this church. I think it's really a blessing. It's a blessing for all the young women and all the young little children and all the young men and all the young boys and girls. And thank you. Thank you for bringing your son in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you all for, thank you for allowing us all to gather here together, Lord. Thank you for the wonderful music that we've heard. Bless the musicians, Lord. Thank you for the beautiful word of God that we're about to hear today, Lord. I ask that you open up our minds and our hearts, Lord, so we can better understand what we're about to learn this evening, Lord. Bless the pastor that's coming to give us the sermon this evening, Lord. I ask you to put a hedge of protection around those that are out there in the streets, Lord, without food to eat, Lord, and that are struggling with drug addictions, Lord. Lord, please save them, Lord. Help them come to you, Lord. Help them see that there's a better way than what they're doing today, Lord. In your most heavenly name, I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you tonight. Amen. Amen. Can you just turn to somebody before we go into to the message tonight? Can you just turn to somebody, look at them, give them the biggest, brightest Sabbath kind of smile, and tell them, happy Sabbath. <laughs> Amen. Tonight... We have a special message that has been inspired by the Lord for me to present to you tonight. But as we go into God's word tonight, can we prepare our hearts as we meditate upon this song? Every day 
they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care. Headed who knows where. On they go with private pain. Living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. Pray with me. Pray with me. Lord, if we ever needed you before, we sure do need you now. 
Lord, it is time that those who are in need find their hope. Lord, it is time that those who are hopeless realize that there is a promise for their lives. And so tonight, may you consecrate this room. May you consecrate even the airways by which this message is being transmitted. So that, Lord, as your word is preached, it may not return unto you void. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Go ahead and switch me over. that one more time. Amen. Amen. Tonight, I want to look at an important topic. Because have you ever fallen out of relationships? Have you ever had a relationship that has fallen apart? And you know that the hardest thing to do is to get that relationship back together again. When relationships break apart, it is not just the connection between two individuals that are broken, but in fact, each individual goes through their moments of pain and anxiety. The good news is that when we think of the greatest separation, it is man from his creator. It is man from his God. And unlike humans, God makes a way for reconciliation to happen. Tonight, I want to talk about how God works in the midst of the lives of his people. Because sometimes we, we go through stuff. Sometimes we have heartaches and we have pain. And, and when it seems that humanity and human agencies have let us down, what we must recognize is that God will never fail us. God will never leave us. God does not abandon us to our circumstance and our situation and it is that when it seems he is the furthest from us that he is in fact the closest. I dare to suggest to you that God has by means of his sanctuary made a place where you and I can find hope in a hopeless situation. You see, when we tend to think of the sanctuary, we, we relegate it to the Old Testament offerings of goats and sheep and lambs. And we think, well, that was done away when Christ came. But I want to suggest to you that in this place of the sanctuary, it is where we find our hope. It is where we find courage and strength to go from day to day. It is where we find the, the power needed to confront the difficulties in our lives. And so when we think of the sanctuary, I want for us to realize that the purpose of the sanctuary is bigger than the sin problem. It is where God comes to meet his people. And because we have access to God, I will suggest to you that there is nothing that we will go through in life 
that we cannot overcome. You see, our power resides in the fact that we are ever present with God. And so it, where it may seem that we are humanly incapable, God allows us to have the power. You see, it is not by might nor by power, the Bible tells us, but he says it is by his spirit. So we recognize that if God is with us, if God is for us, then we are more than the world against us. And so it is that I suggest that because of God's sanctuary, because of what he has set up, it allows us to be able to live a life of victory. This evening, I'd like for us to take a look at God's message of hope that comes to you and I through his word, through the power of his sanctuary. We are going to look at a familiar story, but I'd like for us to take a second look. Can we do that tonight? We are going to go to a passage found in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. And I'd invite you just to read along with me as we set the context for the story that we are about to meet. It reads, now it happened, read with me, one day that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put out a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us he can turn in there now I'd like to set the context by looking at this woman this woman and her husband were people who love the Lord and we know this because when the man of God came, they didn't close their doors. Yeah, right. When the man of God came into town, they weren't too busy for a visit. When the man of God wanted to stop in, they didn't just hurry him through like a drive through but in fact, they sat the preacher down and began to feed him. You see, we, we, we know that they love the Lord. Now, now not everybody loves God's servants. You know, they don't want the preacher all up in their business. They want him to come and to go and to get out as fast as possible. You put him in the room that looks nice, the room that doesn't tell a hundred stories. And he comes and he visits, you give him the smile, and you try to get him out as fast as you can. All the preachers ought to say, have mercy. <laughs> But not only did they, 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 they welcome the man of God in their home and feed the preacher, though the woman now took it a step further. She said, listen, we've got to make a room for this preacher. We've got extra space in our house. And when this man of God comes by, we are going to set up an upper room and we're going to decorate it. And, and we're going to put some furniture in there. We're going to put a bed and a table, a chair and a candlesticks up in here. And they set up the room so that whenever he would come in town, that he would have a place to lay his head. Now, I suggest to you that we learn a couple of things about this woman. First of all, that she loves the Lord. Secondly, she desired for the presence of God to be in the midst of her home. She desired that God would not be too far from her. And if there was an opportunity to have someone who was in connection with God, she would try to enjoy fellowship and worship. It is good to know that there are households that are centered on having God in the midst of them. 
You see, if we are going to experience the full blessing of what God has to offer to us, we can't just try to interact with God once a week, but in fact, we've got to allow God's presence to be in the midst of our home. It's not about having the preacher in your house. It's about having who the preacher represents in your house. It's about the family coming and worshiping together. It's about the family coming and finding and finding themselves at the foot of the cross together, singing together, praying together. As the old adage goes, the family that prays together will stay together. And if we look at statistics today, it makes us wonder how many families are praying together. And so it was that this woman was faithful. And if you continue reading in the chapter 4, we will see that the man of God was blessed by her kindness. So much so that he, he now said to the servant, his servant Gehazi, what can we do to reward this woman for her kindness and her generosity and her faith? And, and, and Gehazi said, well, you notice that they don't have any children. And so it was that the prophet then prophesied and said in the season of life, referring to the spring, that she would have a son. And so it was that about nine months later, a son came. God had blessed her. And I dare to suggest that she, we had already seen that she was a woman of faith. But we've got to realize that living in the world we live in, sometimes things will happen. But as we continue the story, can we take note of something very important? I want you to keep this. Open up the file in your mind, and I want you to tuck this away because I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. In the room that she created for the man of God before we move on, she put what items of furniture in there? She put a table. She put a chair, she put a candlestick, and she put a bed. You got it? File it away? All right, hit save. All right. Now we're going to move on. Because while this woman was a praying woman, while she was a woman who loved the Lord, while she was a woman who was willing to sacrifice and give to the Lord, Recognize that good, that bad things will happen to good people. You see, just because we are a praying people, just because you come to church, just because you worship God and you give a faithful tithe and offering, it doesn't mean that bad things won't come into your life. But what I am suggesting to you is our circumstance and our situation, how they will be resolved is predicated on the foundation that we have built. Oh, I don't think you're with me tonight. The crisis that will come into your life, into your home, into your family, how it will be resolved, no matter how great it is, will be predicated on how you have laid the foundation. Take a look at what happens next. Because the Bible says that when the child grew, now it happened one day. That he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head my head. So he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. Pause here for a minute. The Bible doesn't give us any clear explanation as to what happened. All we know is that this child of promise, the child that was given to this woman of faith, one day he got up and began to complain that he was having head problems. He cried out in pain and agony, my head, my, my head. It doesn't say what is happening or what caused it. But here we find a young man in distress and in pain. And he goes to his father for help. But now comes the next part. Because he is sent to his mother. And when he had taken him, and brought him to his mother, 
he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Crisis. The pain of, of enduring crisis. Many who have had to lose a loved one, particularly a child, can understand better than I can or those of us who have not had to bury our children. The agony and the grief that comes with the crisis of loss. But allow me to suggest that we are living in a world where we will be confronted with such crisis. First of all, let's take a look at this young man one day waking up and having head problems. Can I suggest to you that we can find in this young man a situation that is happening to our young people today? They are having, if you please, metaphorical head problems. You see, what is happening in our society today is that there is an attack on the mind of young people. So much so that young people are being taught to be, to be unable to distinguish between right and wrong. They are being taught that they are supposed to be uh, the, the, the cream of the crop, but then they are told that you are nothing more than a monkey or an animal. You are told, uh, taught that you are supposed to, to grow and to become great things, but yet they are not taught to be accountable and responsible. And what we are seeing happening in our society today is the ramifications uh, of a Dr. Spock generation gone bad where discipline has been taken out, where, where, where parents have had their hands tied behind their back, where children have been left to raise themselves, where children have been forced to endure a families falling apart and having to grow up in the midst of pain and agony and divorce, and there are young people who are crying out in agony and in pain. We are seeing something happening in our society where our young people are, are looking for answers but yet there are none. They are searching and questioning, but it seems that there is no prevailing consensus as to what they should do or where they should go. And when they turn to the institutions that are supposed to help them, he, he runs to his father. But, but I find it ironic that the typical answer that comes from his father in the word of God is, go to your mother. Can I pause here for a minute? Because you see, as men, oftentimes it is easier to push the work of our children unto our mother. And sadly, what has happened is that it has also been enculturated within our society where, 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 where the ideology of our contemporary society says that you don't need a man, not even to have a child with modern technology. And so it is that men are pushed aside. I remember when my first daughter was born. I was excited. And I went to the hospital. I won't call the name. But it was one of those hospitals where they often didn't see the father come in or didn't care if the father was there. Because I remember that I was like that, 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 that furniture in the room that you don't need. You know, the one that you don't know what to do with. Pushed to the left, pushed to the right, and inevitably pushed out the door. You see, we are living in a society where the role of the father, where the role of the man has been, been dismissed, has been minimized. And sadly, what is happening is we bought into the lie. And so it is that the role that men are supposed to play in the lives of their young people, the role that, that men are supposed to, to, to have in influence in children and helping to nurture them and rear them, we are abdicating it either to the mother or to the television or to somebody else. We've been taught that it's all right to hit and run. Oh, I didn't think you caught that. We've been taught that it's all right to hit and run. But what we don't realize is there are consequences. And I'm not just talking about the consequences that come upon the woman, but consequences that come upon the children. 
I was reading a, doc a doctoral study conducted in the early 80s. It was called Absent Fathers, Lost Sons. Now this study began to investigate the absence of males in the home, whether they were physically absent or whether they were just in the house but uninvolved and disconnected. And they talked about how since the emergence of the free love society in the 70s and the, 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 the rise of single parenthood and the, 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 the absence of fathers in the house, that, that they were starting to study the impact upon young children, particularly the boys. And they noticed that as the young men were growing up, they did not find a sense of identity because they could not connect with their father. And sadly, the conclusion of this doctoral study in 1984, catch the year, predicted that what we will see coming forth from the next generation is young men who can no longer identify with being a man and we will see a rise in homosexuality in the next decade, the 90s and 2000. Now standing from our vantage point, 20, 30 years later, I dare to suggest that either his studies were showing what was happening or he must be a prophet. <laughs> Go to your mother. The son was looking to the father for help, but yet there was none. And so it was that he went to his mother. And the word of God tells us that he was placed on his mother's knee and he rested there until noon, until he died. Can I point out another problem that we are seeing in our society? There is the absence of accountability in our society where our youth and our young people are being coddled to death. Oh, I wish somebody was with me. There was a time where you would not get allowance unless you knew how to wash a dish, unless you knew how to clean up your room, unless you knew how to do laundry. And that was just for a dollar. Nowadays, you got Xboxes for 400 and 500, and you'd be lucky if you could get them to throw their mess in the corner. There is a lack of accountability that is pervading our society and what it is doing is debilitating our young people because now when it is time for them to become adults and move out on their own, they do not have the life skills to be able to function. <laughs> I remember how scary it was for me as a young man who grew up in an environment. Now, I didn't understand what my mom was trying to tell me when she said, listen, when you're out, you're out. So I'm going to teach you how to cook. I'm going to teach you how to clean. I'm going to teach you how to do laundry. She said, don't expect some woman to do that for you. You got to know how to do that yourself. Man, I hope I'm not getting y'all in trouble. <laughs> and I didn't understand it. I said, all right, well, moms is just being moms. But then I was maybe around 18, and I, I was now starting to keep my eyes open to, to, to what the, the other gender had to bring to the table. And I finally understood what my mother said when I met a young lady who told me that she could not even cook to the point that she was trying to boil water one day to make mac and cheese, and she burnt the water. <laughs> now, you got to be in bad shape to burn the water. But the lack of accountability in our society is causing a, a, a slew of problems. Problems that are not only affecting the younger generation, but is now impacting the adult generation. Because while there are, are parents who, 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 who maybe have participated in it, the fact is that they want to see their children excel. The fact is that they want their children to become better than they were. They want their children to thrive and to do great things. But now, even in their old age, instead of being taken care of, they are taken care of. 
And so we're seeing a meltdown happening all around our society. And now our society is in crisis because everybody is occupying roles that they were never intended to make, to, to hold. They are doing things that they were not intended to do. And nobody knows exactly where they fit. And so what do we do when all these crises start to hit our lives? You see, our society is interconnected. Dr. King calls it a network of mutuality. Whatever affects one affects all. And so we're finding that crises are arising in our society because everybody is out of place. Everybody is out of whack. Everybody is out of their minds. And, and suddenly there is crisis coming into the midst of our society. And now everybody's asking the question, where is God? Where is God? Why doesn't he order things right? But I love how this woman responds. Because as I suggested to you, if you have laid the proper foundation, when crisis strikes your life, you will have the means not to necessarily change the situation, but to navigate through it. Are you with me? Now we find that the woman, the Bible says, and she went up after her son had died and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Can we pause for a minute? When we think that this young boy had died in his mother's arms, I pondered for a minute her course of action. It says that she took the body of the young boy and carried him to the room of the man of God, of the prophet. But it would seem more natural that a mother, if she was going to take the child to, her, to, 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 to any place to lie down, it would be in his room place where he is safe and comfortable, a place that is familiar. Sometimes grief uh, will overtake us, but, but there is a sense of, uh, 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 of cognizance that comes that, that, that wants them to, to, to still have that child, to still have the sense of security. So I thought it would make more sense that she would bring the child to the room, his room. But she didn't. So you know I had to go study. Why that room? Then I recognized there was a significance to the room. As I went back and I had to reflect and study a little bit more, I had the opportunity to go back to the original languages and I learned from the Hebrew some things about the room. The first uh, thing that we learn about the room is that she, this room was constructed after the model of the sanctuary. First of all, in the, the Hebrew, it kind of describes it as a chamber, a, a square chamber, a cube. Now, there is only one place in the Bible that has the shape of a cube, and that is the most holy place of the sanctuary. Now, now why is the sanctuary so important? Well, first of all, do we even know what the purpose of the sanctuary is? We, we, we know that the sanctuary was there for sacrificing animals. But that is not the purpose. That is the medium, but not the purpose. The purpose is found, Exodus 25 and verse 8. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary. Read it with me, that I may dwell among them. The purpose of the sanctuary wasn't about sacrifices, wasn't about offerings. It was about people having connection with their God. It was God being in the midst of his people. It was God being in the midst of your life. It was God being in the midst of your crisis. It was God being in the midst of 
of your pain. Whatever you would go through, God was there with you. If you went from land to land, God would be there with you. If you went through a rainstorm, God was in it with you. If you went through the sunshine, God was with it, in it with you. The idea was that God would dwell with his people. Now, in recognizing that, we also must understand that the sanctuary existed before sin ever existed. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17 and verse 12, a glorious throne exalted from the beginning is the place of your sanctuary. You see, God's sanctuary existed from the very beginning. It is where God's throne is. Now, now you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with anything? Stay with me. Now, recognize that before sin ever existed, God didn't just create his creatures and send them off, but in fact, there was times where that they would come together for fellowship and for worship, where they would interact and connect, and that was before sin. And so recognize that the sanctuary was where God met his creation. And when we think about the sanctuary after sin, it was where God now tried to restore that fellowship that he had with his people. You see, God only used a different medium to do the same thing, to be involved with the lives of his creatures. Are you with me? All right, stay with me, stay with me. You see... There was something about this room. First of all, this woman was building a place where God would be in the midst. A place where God would be in her life, in her home, in her crisis. But there's more. Let's read this. In Hebrews 9, it gives a description of the sanctuary. It says, for a tabernacle was what? Prepared. The first part in which was a lampstand, the table, the showbread, the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of all these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, in this description in the book of Hebrews, you will notice that it describes that there are four articles of furniture in the sanctuary. What are the four? The four that you have are the table of showbread, you have the candlestick, you have the Ark of the Covenant, and you have the altar of incense. Stay with me for a minute. How many articles of furniture are described as being in the sanctuary? Four. I just listed the four. Now, can we go and let's open our file. How many articles of furniture did she put in the room that she built for the man of God? Four. Allow me to suggest to you that each article of furniture in the room that she built, stay with me, corresponds to the article of furniture in the sanctuary. Are you with me? I, I need for us to be together because we're going to see what God is about to do. You see, when she constructed the room, understand that what she was doing was creating an environment where God would dwell in the midst of his people, her home, her family. Stay with me. Now, each furniture that she put in corresponded. The first, we talk about the table of showbread. That would correspond with the table that was in the room. Are you with me? The second is the candlestick. And if you remember, in the room she put a candle, she put a candlestick. The next was the ark, also called the mercy seat, which would correspond with the chair. chair. So the final article of furniture, stay with me, is the altar of incense, which would correspond with the bed. Now, when her son died, she went and she took him 
and carried him into the room. Not his room, but into the sanctuary, the place where God was. Not just on any article of furniture. She didn't put him on the table. She didn't try to put him on the candlestick. It would have been hard. She didn't put him in the chair, but she laid him on the bed. Allow me to suggest to you that as this woman was going through her crisis, she had learned that there was power in prayer. We recognize that the prayers of the saints would ascend to the Most High from the altar of incense. If you remember in the book of Hebrews and chapter, and chapter 9 that we just read, we recognize that the two articles of the furniture were in the holy place. That was the candlestick and the table of showbread. But the other two were in the most holy place, which were the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and the altar of incense. But... If you actually look at the structure of the sanctuary, the altar of incense was outside of the most holy place. But what happened was its function belonged in the most holy place. Because you see, the people had to have access to the altar of incense so their prayers could be placed on it. And as the smoke went up, it would rise above the veil and go over into the most holy place. Allow me to suggest that when this woman was at the lowest point in her life, when she was at a crisis, she didn't try to tuck that child into his room, into familiar surroundings. She didn't give up. She said, God, you've got to do something about this. This is the child that you've given to me. I'm placing him on the altar of incense, and now I'm calling on you to do something about it. You see, sometimes people will look at our situation and we will write it off. But God says, put it on the altar of the incense. You see, people will dismiss you and count you out. But, but sometimes, instead of criticizing, backbiting, and talking, we've got to put it on the altar of incense. We've got to have that prayer ascending to the Most High God. Are you with me? Now, as she did this, I want us to see what began to happen because now she was no longer trusting in man you see what we realize is she had a hope that even though sin could come into her life and cause a mess that there's a promise that comes from God 2nd Corinthians 5 18 and 19 and all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He tells us this, that even though it seems like God has abandoned us in our crisis, in fact, he's already made a place of reconciliation. You see, the sanctuary allows us that even though we are unworthy, even though we are undeserving, we can have access to God. He's made that available already through Jesus Christ. And so we don't have to be afraid to access the most holy place. He's made it available. And she knew that she could have confidence in God. And so she put it on the altar. Are you with me? Are you with me? Because you see, here's what we've got to realize how God works. Because now she puts the child into the room on the bed. And then she closes the door, walks out, and continues in verse 22. She says this. And she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men, one of the donkeys, that I may run to the man of God and come back. Now, listen to her response. So he said, Why are you going to him today? Neither is it new moon nor the Sabbath. I'm going to pause here. Sometimes we think that the only time we ought to have access to God is when we come to church. You know, we, we're leaving our Bibles on our shelves all week, and we don't want to pull them out. We start running around looking for it on Sabbath morning. Where did I put my Bible? Where did I put my Bible? Where? He was worrying about the fact that it wasn't Sabbath. He was worrying about the fact that it wasn't a, a holy day. She's just like, mm, 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 mm. I'm not into that kind of stuff. 
You see, God lives in the midst of my circumstance. What we've got to realize is that crisis is going to come. But the question I'm asking you is, are you like the man, the husband, who only looks to God once a week? Or is he in your life every day? Because if he is, if he is, you'll be able to do what she did next. And she said, oh, y'all read that. She said, somebody read it. She said, it is well. Now, think about this response. She held her son in her arms till noon. He dropped dead in her lap. She picks him up, carries him on the bed, and then walks out and says, get me the donkey. I'm going to the man of God. Everything all right? Ah, it's good. She ought to be out of her mind. Except that God was in the midst of her life every day. So when she put that child on that bed, on that altar of incense, she walked away in faith, knowing God had heard her prayer. You see, when crisis comes, are we going to walk with faith? And so she says, not it will be well. You see, she wasn't saying, I'm going to go to the man of God, and when I get to the man of God, the man of God is going to have to do something. He gave me that child. And No, 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 my trust is not in the man of God. My trust is in God. So I'm just going now to follow through on the process. So I'm telling you that it's already well. Somebody ought to get excited tonight. Because even before you've gone to try to resolve the issue, if you put it on the altar, it is well. Even though the, 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 the bank and the creditors may be calling you, it is well. Even though the school may be trying to tell you something about your child, it is well. Even though your company is talking about downsizing and laying off, it is well. Even though your home may be in a mess, it is well. And so here's what she does. She goes and she rides. And as she is riding, she goes ahead and the man of God sees her. And he is older, so he sends his young servant, his intern, Gehazi, and says to Gehazi, get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him. Uh, uh, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. So after she now met up with Elisha, she told Elisha the problem. And Elisha says, I can't move that fast. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my intern my staff. My staff is a symbol of the authority that God has given to me. And so I'm going to have him go. And he's going to lay the staff on the child and let God do what he does best. Sounds good, except for one problem. Because now the Bible says, now Gehazi went ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and told him, saying, the child is not awakened. There's a problem here. Because I talked about some of the institutions that have been failing our society in a time of crisis. Here it was that Gehazi was to represent the church, the entity that was supposed to, 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 to carry or to, to demonstrate the power and authority of God in this world. He was given the staff that signified authority, and he went to go lay the staff on the child, but nothing happened. As we are going to learn about Gehazi, Gehazi was in it for the money. Gehazi was the one who, after Naaman got healed, tried to hit him up for a bigger offering. Gehazi was the one who was about self-glorification and self-pride. And sometimes what we've got to realize is when we are in it to represent God, then we've got to be all in it or we are going to misrepresent God. And when people need us the most, we will have no power. The problem that people have with the church is that they're coming to the church and looking for help, but the church is so far disconnected from God that the people come and they're crying out, where is the power? 
See, Gehazi was more concerned about everything else, but instead he should have been connected with God. One of the challenges and, and that we as a God's people must have is that we must realize that we can't give it if we don't have it. If we aren't connected, how on earth are we going to pray and intercede for somebody else? If you haven't been praying all week, what kind of power are you going to have when somebody says, pray for me, I'm dying of cancer? What kind of power are you going to have when somebody says, pray for me, I'm about to lose my job? You see, we want people to, to, to come to church. But if we are disconnected from the source of power, we cannot give anything. I learned that the hard way the other day. I was trying to charge my, 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 my um, phone through my laptop. But the cord had been pulled out from the laptop computer. And before I knew it, both the laptop and the phone died. Because it was disconnected from the source, inevitably, as it was giving out, itself was made to die. That will happen in the church if we are not connected with God. We are going to be trying to give out, but we have nothing to give, and we too will be sucked dry. So God wants for us to plug in. So instead now the man of God looks at the scenario and says, Gehazi, let me do it. See, it wasn't about a show of authority or power, but he knew he was connected. He was ready to do this. And so it was that the Bible says that when Elisha came to the house, there was the child lying on his bed. He went in, therefore, Shut the door behind them. You see, it's not about everybody knowing what's happening. It's just simply about letting God do what he does best. And the two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. Then the Bible says, and he went up and lay on the child and out, out, put his mouth on his mouth his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. Can I pause for a minute? Because what we've got to understand is the power and the significance of what he did. You see, when we realize that God has made his love available to us, we've got to be willing to make that love available to others. You know, we try to help people from a distance. You know, I'm going to pray for you, but I ain't going to sit down to take two minutes to hear your problem. You know, when you ask somebody how you're doing, and when they turn around to say, you're already halfway down this corner talking about hi to somebody else. If we are going to be able to tap into the power God says we've got to get in close and personal. And so the Bible says that Elisha came. He looked at the child and he put his mouth on his mouth. He put his eyes on his eyes. He put his body on his body. All of a sudden, the child started to become warm. Now, you see, something was starting to happen. Naturally, this is what we would call transference. The warmth that was in him, what he possessed, was immediately started to be imparted to the child. But while that was enough to warm him up, it wasn't enough to bring him life. Because you see, while we as God's people are called to be that medium of transference, to bring warmth, to bring that life, to bring that connection, this is where the power of the Holy Ghost of Jesus Christ is needed. Because after this, the Bible tells us, that he returned, and he went back and forth in the house again and went up and stretched himself on the child, and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Allow me to suggest to you that as he continued and persevered with the individual, all of a sudden something began to happen as he was lying there, mouth against his mouth. He would breathe out and the child would suck it in his breath was being transferred to the child's breath I suggest to you that in this position 
he was exemplifying what Christ does for us in our crisis. Christ breathed into us life when there existed nothing but death. Christ uh, imparted to us warmth when we were cold and are ready to be buried in the ground. Christ's blood began to circulate into our bodies and all of a sudden life started to come back into the midst of us. As Elisha lived with Christ, so too could the child live. I dare to suggest that Elisha was typifying Christ for the name Elisha means my God saves. The good news tonight is that when we come to the place of reconciliation, when we come to God's sanctuary, it doesn't matter how far gone you are. It doesn't matter how messed up your life is. It doesn't matter how bad your situation is. Jesus isn't too high and mighty to come and to look at your situation and say, this means I've got to get all into this and I'm going to lie there with you if you cry I cry if you need to breathe I'll give you breath and when we when he lives we live so recognize that God's sanctuary was created so that you and I could continue to sustain fellowship with him so no matter how bad life gets God says I'm in it with you and I'm in it with you until you come back to life. It may be a whole new start for you, but understand that I'll give you a new begin, and your latter ends shall be better than your beginning. You see, when Job, when Job, when Job was going through his crisis, he struggled, questioned, wondered, why was God doing this? It seemed like God had forgotten him, but, but in the midst of his sorrow, God spoke to him. And the Bible tells us that when he started, I've got to read this to you. I don't even like to tell this story. I've got to just read this. Can we turn your Bibles? I don't have it in the screen. The Spirit is telling me I've got to just read this to you. Psalms 40, uh, Job 42. Job 42. Job 42. And I love what the word of the Lord says. Beginning at verse 12. It says, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. You see, it says, for he had 14,000 sheep. Now, if you will read at the beginning, Job lost 7,000 sheep. But now at the end, God gave him 14,000 sheep. The Bible says he had 6,000 camels. If you read in chapter 1, he lost 3,000 camels. But God gave him six. You see, it says he had 1,000 yoke of oxen. If you remember, Job lost 500 yoke of oxen. It says that he had 1,000 she-asses. But Job lost 500 she asses. It says that he also had seven sons and three daughters. Let's pause for a minute. He lost, but what God gave him back was double. This is what the law tells us of double portion. When God breathes back life into your crisis, he will give you double what you lost. Now, I get excited about this because I see that Job was blessed doubly. But, but you know what the amazing thing is? In reading this, it tells us only one thing, though. That in verse 13, he had seven sons and three daughters. But he lost seven sons and three daughters. Hmm. Well, everything is doubled except for that. But no, it isn't. Because you see, God gave him seven more sons and three more daughters. 
And God, when he comes again, because Job believed that when he would die, he would be resurrected once again, and that he would be once again in the land of the living when Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, not only would he be resurrected, but the children that he lost would be resurrected. And so when all is said and done, Job would have 14 sons and six daughters, double portion. Understand that if you are going through a crisis, what you You've got to do is stay connected with God. What you've got to do is to keep holding on because no matter how much you've lost, God has another move. You see, you see, you see, you see, let me close with this. Let me close with this. You can go ahead and play something for me. Let me close with this. Dr. Faustus, as the, the legend goes, as the legend goes, Dr. Faustus was living in medieval Europe at the time, and he wanted to be a very famous man. And so it was that he would do anything to secure great wealth and mansions and prestige. And so it was that he made a deal with the devil. It was that he, he, he one night sat down and began to, to, to ponder on all the things he wanted in life. And it was that the devil came to him and said, I will give you all of these things if you will give me your soul when I require it. And so it was that Dr. Faustus thought about it and said, okay, what do I need to do? So the devil pulled out a long contract, told him all the things that he would give him, and the one stipulation that whenever he required it, that he must give his soul. So it was that the next day Dr. Faustus woke up. He had wealth beyond imagination. He had fame beyond his comprehension. He became world renowned throughout Europe. And he began to live the life he had always dreamed of living. But one day, after he had been enjoying life, he was at the height of his experience. He went home to his mansion and he saw sitting in the chair the devil Dr. Faustus remembering the agreement that he had signed said not tonight I'm doing so well can we do this another time the devil said to him don't you remember our contract he goes please 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 I'm, I'll do anything but the devil pulled out the contract and showed him what he had signed, not with pen, but in fact with his own blood. He said, it's not at your discretion, it's at mine. You see, the devil will, will, will let you enjoy your sin for a season. But it's when he has you that he comes to claim your soul. Dr. Faustus was distressed. He said, no, I've got to find a way out of this. The devil says, you can look it over all you want, but at midnight tonight, your soul is mine. Dr. Faustus was in agony and in despair because he didn't know what to do. The legend grew, and so it was that an artist decided that he would depict this night in a painting. He decided to draw this painting of the devil sitting at a table, in one hand holding a contract, laughing. In the middle between them was a chessboard, and on it, Dr. Faustus had one piece left, his king. Dr. Faustus was sitting there dejected, looking at the board for a way out, but there was no other move to make. The artist entitled the piece, Checkmated. You see, there was nothing else that could be done. And so it was that for centuries they told the story of Dr. Faustus. Eventually that painting was placed in a museum in England. And the tour guide would go and he would tell all of the visitors to the museum the same story that I told you about Dr. Faustus. 
And one day there was a tour group that was going through. And as they were going through, he told the story, but there was one man who seemed very intrigued by the painting. And the group left and they marched on, but this man, he stood there, arms crossed, looking intensely at the picture. He refused to move. The, the, the group went through and he stood there for hours staring at the painting. Finally, after a couple of hours, it just broke out like a piercing shriek. It's a lie. Everybody in the museum heard that loud, piercing sound, and they were wondering what it was. The man who was staring at the picture after three hours of silence screamed out, it's a lie. It's a lie, I tell you. It's a lie. The security got notified and ran down and tried to restrain the man and said, don't you see? It's a lie. It's a lie. This painting, it's a lie. And suddenly the tour guide came back and said, sir, calm down. Calm down. What is it? He said, I'm trying to tell you it's a lie. He said, what's a lie? He said, you see, I am a chess grandmaster. And I want you to know that despite what's in this painting, the king has another move. You see, what I'm trying to tell you is that the enemy of God wants you to think that you are checkmated, that you are down and out, and that your life is over. But I want you to know tonight that that's a lie because the king has another move. You see, even though man may write you off, Jesus has another move. Even though people may count you out, the king has another move. And so tonight, because Jesus' blood was shed on Calvary's tree, because Jesus' blood was shed for you and me, I declare to you that he's made a place where you can find liberty, you can find healing, you can find forgiveness, you can find grace. And I want you to know tonight that in your life, the king has another move. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet with me. Stand to your feet, stand to your feet, stand to your feet because God is about to do something great. Stand to your feet. There may be somebody in this room tonight. Somebody who has been going through. Somebody who is at a point where they don't know where to turn or where to go. But I want you to know tonight that the king has another move for your life. You see, you don't have to wait until your life hits rock bottom in order to give it to him. All he's telling you is, listen, give me your life now, and I'm going to show you things you've never imagined. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. As I make my appeal, if there's somebody in this room tonight, whether you've hit rock bottom or you've got to change direction and make a U-turn, I'm going to invite you tonight to come to the front and ask the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to do something new in your life. If tonight you need to make that change, if you need to experience something different, God has already made the way for you. And I'm going to invite you to come to the altar. If there's somebody tonight, if there's somebody tonight, I'm going to invite Pastor O'Bannon, Pastor Man, can you come and meet those who are going to come? Because I know that there's somebody who tonight needs the Lord to do something. The pastors will meet you here at the front. Tomorrow there have already been those who declared that they want a new start, they want a new beginning, and they are going to go all the way in baptism with Jesus. Tomorrow morning we're going to celebrate that because they've recognized that there is power. But, but it's not too late for you. Tonight, if that's you, I'm going to invite you to come. Come to the front. Come to the front. God bless you, my sister. Is there somebody else? Is there somebody else? Is there somebody else? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. You see, God has already made the way for you. He's not trying to tell you to lose everything. He's saying, I've got a better path for you right now. 
right here today, if you'll make the decision, I'll do something that you've never imagined. If that's you tonight, I'm inviting you come and give your life to Christ. And you will see that he will take you on paths you've never imagined. If that's you, just come, just come, just come, just come, just come, just come. The Savior's calling. He's waiting to enter your heart. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. If you know it, sing with me. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart what is your answer to him is there somebody else is there somebody else time after time time if there's somebody else I'm going to invite you to come to the altar make your way to the altar I'm not going to prolong the appeal much longer but if you desire to respond to the Savior's appeal, I want you to come to the front right now. Just come right now and give your heart and your life to him. Because the Savior desires the best for you. And he doesn't want to see you waste your life. If that's you tonight, just come. Just come. If that's you tonight, just come. As I close the appeal, I'm going to invite those who've also made the decision to be baptized tomorrow. I'm going to invite you just to come to the altar. I'd like to say a special prayer for you tonight. If you've decided that you're going to be baptized and you'll be baptized tomorrow morning, if you're here with us, I'm going to invite you just to make your way to the altar. And we're going to have a special prayer for you as we close tonight. God bless you, my sister. Just come. And while they're coming, if there's anybody else, if there's anybody else, maybe where you are, maybe you're not ready to give your life to God fully, but you know where you are is a place you shouldn't be, and you need, you need prayer. Slip your hand up, slip your hand up, slip your hand up if you want me to pray for you. Slip your hand up and I'll say a special prayer for you. I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. I see your hand. Let's sing the chorus one more time, and then we're going to pray. And now he is waiting to see if you are willing to open the door. If there's anybody else, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let us pray. Gracious God, I want to thank you so much for those who have come to the altar. Lord, because you desire to take us from the guttermost and raise us to the uttermost. You desire to make us into a new creation. So I want to praise you that a decision has been made tonight to give you their all. Lord, I want to thank you for those who will be baptized in the watery grave of baptism tomorrow. Lord, I'm asking that even as these new lives have, have been committed to you, that today you will send angels to stand guard around them. Father, that you will preserve them and protect them, that you will guide them and lead them. Lord, I'm asking that you've seen those hands that have gone up. Hands that are struggling. Father, I'm asking that where they are, that you will continue to minister to them, that you will help them, that you will heal them, that you will grant them hope in their crisis. And Lord, that you will break the chains that are binding their lives. 
Father, for every household that is represented in here tonight, I pray that you will do great and marvelous things. I pray that your home will be in the midst of their home. So that, Father, that when the crisis comes, the foundation will be prepared. So, Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for how you will save and lead us. And, Lord, may we be ready when you come again. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor, and I want you to tell them the king has another move for your life. My sister, God bless you. God bless you. Just stay to the front. I'm Pastor Man. We're just going to come and we're going to just pray with you. So just stay right here. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. The king indeed has another move. Uh, let's put our hands together to give God the glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As we are on the final weekend of our series here,